recording. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Parks Academy monthly webinar series. My name is Hannah Cleveland, and I am hosting today from the World Parks Academy here at Indiana University in the United States. Um, these webinars are a collaboration between the World Parks Academy and World Urban Parks. Um, before we begin, can everyone hear me all right? If you can not hear me, um, let me know by typing in the chat feature. Also, if you have any questions, you may type them in there and I'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation. If you could save any questions about the presentation to the very end, we'll have about 10 minutes to answer those. Um, CEUs are available for your participation. Um, the webinar will be recorded and available on provalenslearning.com. Uh, today's speaker is Melanie Langlotz, and she's presenting on the topic of digital playgrounds. Melanie is the CEO of the tech startup GEO AR Games. She started out as a visual effects artist in the film and TV industry back in 1990 and then moved into the world of gaming and augmented reality in 2011. GEO AR Games has the goal of getting kids off the couch and physically active outside. So we look forward to her presentation today. On over to you, Melanie. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so I'm Melanie. I'm the CEO of GEO AR Games. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know. Um, it stands for Geospatial Augmented Reality Games, which is pretty much what we do and what we specialize in. I am in the beautiful New Zealand in um, Huia, which is West Auckland. And um, today is a little bit rainy, but it's summertime, you know, the world is upside down here with the weather. Um, but hopefully we're going to get some sunshine later on. Okay, let me get straight away started because we've got quite a bit to go through. You may every now and then hear some chirping in the background. That's my birds. We've got a bit of a zoo here going on. All right. Oops. And now I can't actually move forward with my clicker. Here we go. Okay, cool. So Magical Park is the product that we're best known for. It is um, the world's first digital playground. I can honestly say that we earned the title. Um, a lot of people have tried to do something like that, but we were definitely first. We even came out before Pokemon Go. And um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the first prototype was developed in 2012, but we didn't launch the company until quite a bit later. So first of all, what's augmented reality and what's virtual, virtual reality? A lot of people get a bit confused about that. Um, it's relatively easy when you think about augmented reality as a, computer, um, as a computer graphics which are superimposed over live video feed and virtual reality is 100% synthetic and always 3D. So that's one way of kind of telling the difference between the two of them. So with augmented reality, you will always see some form of live video feed coming through the device that you're using and with virtual reality you're fully in a 3d room pretty much or 3d environment so as i said um we founded GeoAR games back in september 2015 um we used geospatial augmented reality which is a specific type of augmented reality and i will give you in this webinar a bit of an insight into tech so you can um, understand the different types that are out there and we were very much focused on healthy children. And the reason why is because my own stepdaughter back then when she was seven had lost all interest in going outside and going to the playgrounds that she used to love so much. And we find that a lot of kids at the age of seven, eight lose interest in playgrounds and just get hooked on digital devices. And so by now the global stats are that across the world, children sit about eight and a half hours per day and that is a lot so we're basically seeing a decline in kids playing outside so i want to quickly give you an introduction as to what magical park is i've got a video here and that should explain a little bit Magical Park is the world's first digital playground that councils can subscribe to so you can play it for free in your local park. The look. It is our mission to get kids off the couch and active outside through digital outdoor games. 
I really like the idea of young people coming together and experiencing these kinds of games where they're interacting with one another, they're still engaged in something that's, that they feel is their own. Got them running around and it was wonderful. Well, it's a great game because you get to add in nature. I like the dinosaur one and it's called how it's 3D. Awesome! Download it for free from the App Store or from Google Play Store. Oops. Yeah, let me get to the next one. Okay, so over the last three years, uh, we've managed to work with over a hundred councils across New Zealand and Australia. So in other parts of the world, they're not called councils, they're like called um, cities or city or park authorities. It's pretty much all the same. So basically we have worked over the last three years with over a hundred different cities, so to speak. And our biggest record has been Parks Week, where we had over 24,000 visitors to parks um, in one week. So that was pretty awesome because that was obviously one of our uh, motivations and goals to get as many people in the community out into parks using uh, digital technology. So as you can see, the big picture for us was let's get the kids off the couch using what they love so much and get them active at least. And, um, and that way, you know, once they're out there, what we found, what we found is that um, quite often the kids start to rediscover again the fun of playgrounds, the fun of being outside, climbing trees, kicking a ball around after they have been playing the game. It's just a matter of how can you get them outside in the first place. So the value that we learned we were providing to the community was way, far, way more than what we had actually expected. It was getting tech-minded families outside for starters. Um, we created family bonding time. A lot, a lot of families recorded back, reported back to us and said, hey, you know, we had an awesome day. Dad played with the boy and mom played with the girl and they were playing against each other on the mobile phones. Kids are motivated to read in order to play. That's what we learned from teachers and schools who have been using Magical Park. And it makes a boring park more interesting, is what a lot of kids told us. It also allowed councils or cities to do surveys with the communities. And of course, we're always able to collect park data. So the next thing is, um, in order to play our game, Magical Park, uh, you need to have a smartphone and a tablet. And you need to have, um, because it's GPS-based augmented reality, specific sensors built into the device. And you need to have a park where the, park, where the game is actually activated. So you can't play Magical Park everywhere, like for instance, Pokemon Go. It, will only, um, it, it is only accessible in parks that it have, have actually been activated by us. And um, that for, that, that's for safety, that's for reasons that um, kids can't run on the roads and don't um, get run over and whatever. So that was the difference with Pokemon Go. So what our game needs at this point in time is it needs four sensors. And those four sensors have to be built into the device, a GPS, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a compass. So the GPS, as you all know, is basically giving you the coordinates of where you are. Our game is based on park coordinates. So we basically pick the center coordinates of the park and that is where we locate the game. But a GPS um, is obviously very much susceptible to the environment. So for instance, if you're standing under a tree or if you're indoors, a GPS can be wildly inaccurate. So that's the reason why we're going for open park spaces. Um, an accelerometer measures the speed forward and um, the gyroscope measures the rotation around the axis when you hold it and the compass basically true north. So between all those four, we create something which is called sensor fusion. It is in a way not that different from what you can do nowadays with the new phones with AR Core and AR Kit, which is probably a little bit, some, some of you may not may never have heard of those terms, but that is basically what you now see the top end phones doing where you can track in an environment and you don't need the GPS anymore. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But those are the four sensors that you need at the moment to play our game. Um, so AR Core and AR Kit have come out a few years ago and they basically use those sensors 
to track the world around you. So what they do and how they work is they scan the environment, they take um, certain points and memorize them and, and scan the environment. And that is how they are able to take 3D objects and plant them in your environment. And you're able to do a circle and look around and walk around and things stay reasonably stable. There are limitations to that. So for instance, outdoor light can be a real issue because that is how the tracking markers that they're using in your environment are changing. The other thing is that this is only available on the newest devices at this point in time. So for instance, your iPhone 6S is able to handle AR kit, um, but anything beyond that doesn't. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of Android devices are not capable of doing this yet. They're not capable of doing AR core. And um, so, by designing something that only uses AR Core, AR Kit, you're cutting out a huge demographic um, straight away. And a lot of families and, and kids obviously don't necessarily have the latest devices. So you want to keep that in mind when you're choosing a digital playground and, um, and consider that. So I've got a video here for you, which gives you a bit of an idea what's happening um, in the world of AR. This is a video from Niantic. Niantic are the makers of Pokemon Go. And this is just to show you um, what's basically possible these days. So that video showed you a little bit of the technology, what's happening, but this is all pretty much just happening on the newer devices. And um, as I said, that rules out a lot of the um, bigger demographic or wider demographic. Now then we've also got beacons, <clears throat> excuse me. And beacons is something that have been, they've been around for ages. And um, what they basically do is they can provide just a go signal. So you can position them somewhere, and just use them as a green light to kick things off, to kick the game off. So for instance, um, you have them in a shopping mall or you have them in a park, and depending on how they've been set up, say it's like been three meters or 15 meters or 50 meters, that is when um, the device will recognize, yep, I've got the goal, the green light, and now I can play. Now what I like about beacons is that A, they're trusted technology, they've been around for ages, um, they're very easy to to um, to work with, and you can basically use them instead of a GPS signal. So you can say, "I'm installing a beacon, <clears throat> and I always know that this beacon will be in the same position." Versus a GPS GPS coordinates can vary quite widely depending on the GPS reading of the mobile device. So beacons are way more stable. The only downside that we have of that is um, here is an exploded beacon is that the battery, for instance, in outdoor uh, conditions doesn't last very long. It dies very quickly. So that can be a frustration when you're trying to use it outdoors. Indoors, they are absolutely fantastic. And um, there's not much to say against them. They're a great way to, to uh, build indoor-outdoor games. Then we have image recognition and QR code. So image recognition on the left, I've got a picture of just some rocks. And this is a, um, an image that um, Gregoria, which is like one of the 
key components for image recognition uses to explain to people, this is the perfect marker, the perfect augmented reality marker image, because it doesn't have any patterns, it's got a lot of contrast, and it's, it's inorganic, like there is, there is nothing that is repeated within what it looks like. So um, when you look at the QR code, they're trying to kind of do the same thing by randomly having black and white pixels in the picture. And so what happens is that this becomes a barcode, whether as an image or whether as a QR code, that you can then link to a video or website or something else, or even a 3D object that you place on top of it. So this is a really, really simple um, way to do augmented reality. And you can use it with um, park signs, you can use it with flyers, you can use it in a lot of different ways and it's very inexpensive. Now just to show you what that looks like when we're testing this. So here now on the left over the stones, you see loads of yellow little crosses. That is how we find out whether an image is perfect for image recognition, for augmented reality. The more yellow crosses there are, the more the picture will work in, in, a, in a programming setting, in an outdoor setting. So that's fantastic. So then obviously um, with what we are doing, that's quite different. So we're using geospatial and we've now seen a couple of different types of what can be done with beacons, with ARKit, ARCore, and all these other technologies. There is now another way where we've basically excluded the GPS as well. We're just using the accelerometer, the gyroscope and the compass. And, um, and then you can play the game outdoors or indoors. But what that also means is that you can play it anywhere. So the risk is there that a child might play the game where they shouldn't be. So that's the reason why we always want to link them with GPS or with a beacon so that we dictate where the children play and that they play in a safe space and not on the road and get run over. So now I'm going into something different, which is basically how does that work? How, how do we work the business model and um, yeah, all of that? What, what sort of thoughts have gone into the business that we've built? So there are 2 million apps on the App Store and it is really difficult to find an app and to get noticed. And um, the other thing is that you don't actually make much money anymore from the App Store either. And that's pretty much the reason why we decided that we're not going to rely with marketing the games on the App Store. We talked to a number of councils in uh, New Zealand and they basically said, look, all over the world, councils and cities and park authorities don't have a lot of money. This is what we can pay. And so we said, all right, let's just kind of like do it for that sum. So we basically came up with $2,500 per park for the year or $500 per park for the week. And we can turn the parks on and off within five minutes, but the councils or the park authorities have to agree with us on the parks. We check the parks via Google satellite image and then a park person has to go and test the park. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that in a moment. The key things that the community likes about what we're doing is that it's ethical gaming, there is no in-app advertising, families really don't like advertising to children, there's no in-app purchases, which means the kids don't come running non-stop and ask for money, you know, or, or credit card access and um, can't abuse it either. There's no third-party data mining, which is very big at the moment with data privacy, especially when you're dealing with kids. It's gender neutral content and we don't allow violence or shooting and it's free to play for the community. So for the community, that's absolutely great as long as they have a device. And we find that 90% of all households have got a device that will work within their family. And, um, but it may be that the kids don't own the device, but the parents are normally quite happy to lend the kids their device because it's on a grassy surface in a park. Health and safety is really huge, especially since Pokemon Go. And what I learned from a lawyer the other day who's been working on some of the cases is that Niantic, who is um, behind Pokemon Go, they just settled a hell of a lot of court claims um, in order to uh, quieten down those companies that have been really, really affected by Pokemon Go and where a large number of players have been playing and damaged or were just, you know, where, where it was just wrong for those people to be. So that's why we're restricting it to park spaces. So that park space is agreed on with the council. 
it has to be a big, large, open, grassy park space. Um, we advise that you make sure you play test yourself. There shouldn't be any water like streams or ponds nearby because there is always the danger that, you know, a child might walk into it. Um, no busy roads unless they are securely fenced off with a high tall fence. Uh, check for steps. Kids could fall down while playing. Are there any other obstacles kids could trip over? We, for instance, had one um, where there were uh, train tracks and we had to make the call whether it was safe or not. Um, then not only check for possible other conflicting events during the time, but also is there construction. And that is something we've run into quite often where the event organizer would think, yeah, the park is fine, everything is good. And then we would go there to check and um, there were construction, there were holes dug up, there was machinery because it was a playground update or something else. So do make sure that you check, check the, the park space from all angles. When we're looking at marketing, um, that's a whole different subject. So spreading the word um, about something that's invisible is a real challenge. And that's probably been the biggest challenge for us to date. Um, how do you market something that's invisible? You can set it up and you can have a fantastic game and the kids love us and the parents give us great feedback, but if nobody can see it, um, then it's much, much harder. So think about it, a real playground, you drive past, you see it, and that's enough for the kids to say, can we go back to there? But something that is virtual or alternate reality, you don't see, so it's much harder. So things that we basically looked at how can we advertise it is, of course, park science. Now, here with the park science, what we learned is that it works better if there is information on it that helps to find out, first of all, what is it? How do you access it? Um, what's the data that it uses? Because a lot of parents are worried about the data use. Um, that it has a support link and that it shows where exactly in the park do I need to be to play. So those are the, the things that you also need to kind of consider. The more info information, the better, really. And um, in New Zealand, QR codes don't work quite as well, but I know that in other parts of the world, it's quite normal. So we've started to integrate QR codes, nevertheless, on our park signs for people to just scan it and it takes them straight to the website. Social and community. So, of course, you want to use social media, but I'm all, always amazed how the marketing strategies that I then see happening to advertise the park are just not optimum. So they might kind of use um, the logo or like, you know, the image icon or um, just, you know, no image at all and advertise the park. And because it's just in writing, people have got no idea what to expect. They, have, they just can't understand. You need to link a video to it. And we're providing plenty of videos. There is no shortage of videos from us. And um, that basically helps parents when they're watching it, when they're looking at it, understand what it is. We've had so many families show up at parks expecting real dinosaurs, like at least models of dinosaurs. They expected a dinosaur exhibition. They expected something that was physical, tangible. And when they showed up, um, they were disappointed, they didn't understand. They didn't understand it was an app that they had to download. The other thing is um, we try and tell them on social media that they need to download it at home, not only because um, they can download it at home over Wi-Fi, uh, but also their device may not be suitable. They may have a really old device, so we don't want them to be, to be disappointed coming to the park and then um, the phone doesn't work and they can't find it on the app store. Um, so that's another one. We've also learned that parents will sometimes discourage their children from playing if there isn't anyone else playing. So one thing that, that helps is if the digital playground is located close by to a real playground. So that means the parents can have their little children play on the real playground while the older children play on the side the game. And then it's, it's, it works a little bit better. 
Um, I've got an ice cream cone here on, on the incentives because one of the councils or cities that we work with had a fantastic idea. So they put a social media post out advertising their digital playground and saying for the first 100 families who come to this park on Saturday, Sunday to play, they get free ice creams and the parents get free coffee. And that didn't cost them much. It was like a marketing expense of $600 and it worked a treat. They had the best numbers of all the parks in New Zealand and it was just outstanding. The other thing they did was they had the park space fenced off with tape, so it made it look a little bit more important. And, um, and they did use the videos that we had um, advised them to use and, um, and then they also used traditional media, which is on the right here, news. And so with the news again, if it's not properly explained what it is, if parents don't get a sense of what to expect when they get there and what they need to do, if there are no web links and it just says, go to the app store and download Magical Park, um, a lot of people may not necessarily understand how to do that. So it does help to kind of like cite the web page and just send them there and um, just to make sure that there is no confusion. Um, to give you an idea what is one of my real bugbear marketing frustrations, so this is the sort of typical image that a lot of cities will use as marketing footage. So they take a picture like this and they put it together with their news article or they put it on social media. And unfortunately, this picture doesn't tell anything. All you see is a little girl with a tablet, but you have no idea what she is looking at, what to expect, what's the game. A lot of parents will always want to see the content of the game before they will allow the child to play. So that is again the reason why we encourage people to put as many videos up to attract community as possible and we provide them, there's really no issue and they can even take the original video and upload it to their website if they don't want to use YouTube or, or any of our other video channels. But the video or the, the picture does need to show the content so that people get an idea what to expect. It is so vital. So then what's el what else is out there that gets kids excited and um, that's basically, you know, um, a digital playground. So there are some um, companies out there by now who are using image recognition like we talked about earlier on on traditional playgrounds and um, it's interesting in New Zealand that approach has been pretty much shredded and I sort of can understand why because kids below the age of seven tend to still want to go to the playground there is nothing wrong with them wanting to go outside they're happy to go to the playground they enjoy it they love it they love spending time with their parents at the playground and they don't need a device they don't need it so why add it that's the bit that i don't quite understand and so i'm probably as a parent siding with the other parents who say if the child is still happy to go outside why do i need to add technology um so yeah so so that was the big fire back that we got here in New Zealand. Uh, the other thing is obviously that, um, yeah, it's, it's depending on how the markers are attached to the play equipment, it can be dangerous. I don't think that this specific um, game is unsafe. I think they, they've done everything that they can. Um, I guess for a city, it requires hardware installation, which is a little bit more expensive than what we do. Um, but on the other hand, it's more visible. It's something that you can see and um, where you straight away know and get curious, what is this? So at the same time, I guess what we are trying to do with, with park signs, they are doing with, you know, like the, the image recognition signs that they have attached to the play structures. Um, here's something else that we did um, a while ago. So um, Wellington City Council asked us to create an augmented reality center parade. They had Lambton Key, which is that big road that you see there, uh, completely closed for the Christmas parade. And um, so that entire street was basically filled by us with augmented reality. We had a center sleigh fly up and down the street 
and that was all done with a combination of image recognition and GPS. So the sleigh was linked to GPS coordinates up and down the road and um, the puzzle pieces that you see at the top were all linked to image recognition which were window decals that the shops displayed in their windows. And so the kids could run up and down the street and collect all the different puzzle pieces in order to win, win a voucher and in order to complete the puzzle and play a few games. Uh, that was quite well received. It was really fun. And again, it was free for the community and for the council. It was quite inexpensive to, to have. Here is an example which is quite different. So this is a projection game. Um, that kids and schools can play inside, indoors. And I think this is a good example as well because a lot of people ask, what can you do indoors? This is not so much augmented reality, it's projection gaming, but it's not that dissimilar. Instead of running around with a phone, you basically have projection against the wall. So have a look at this. like my computer didn't quite want to play this all right but you got the you got the idea basically that um, the kids throw a ball against the wall and that's the way how they manage to play so now at the end I just want to touch base on what's happening in Asia now we've been forwards and backwards to China and um, we've talked with a lot of companies over there with a lot of gaming companies and with a lot of people who are in the theme park business so theme parks are very big in Asia and theme parks around the world are having the same issue, which is that the construction of theme parks is very expensive. To give you an idea, one meter of a roller coaster costs um, 10,000 US dollars to make. And um, so the construction of a theme park is, is enormously expensive. And so the return of investment takes a long time. And that's the reason why theme parks and specifically are starting to look to digital content because it's easier to update. In a way, it's um, in more exp inexpensive and it doesn't take as long with construction and it doesn't need the same maintenance and often it's not as dangerous as um, with some of the, the roller coasters that we've got out there as well. So that is part of the reason why they are now looking to um, augmented reality and virtual reality. So the Harry Potter theme park, for instance, in the US is a great example for that. And um, so we basically got approached by a couple of theme parks in China who said, um, can you build something for us? Um, in Asia in particular, um, they have an issue with shopping malls that um, are more and more empty. They are more and more losing foot traffic to online e-commerce. So what's happening in China is that all the playgrounds are happening indoors. And that is mainly because some of the big cities are so polluted, the air is so polluted, that families don't feel safe to let their kids play outdoors. So that's why playing indoors is seen as more as safer. Plus, um, because of the one-child policy in China, I think parents are also more helicopter parents is what we call them, you know, more worried about their child hurting themselves or, or um, yeah, basically, you know, like getting injured. So indoor is seen as safer. And that is why in, in Asia, they have gone to great, great length of um, creating indoor theme parks. And it is absolutely fascinating to look at what they have done in terms of playgrounds. And they're only just shifting to digital. So here, for instance, you see a couple of examples. Um, there is on the top right is horse riding on the rooftop. So this is one of the attractions that they're offering in China. You've got a soccer field inside a shopping mall. And the one that amazed me the most was a 300 meter long Italian indoor beach inside a shopping mall. It is absolutely mind blowing. So now you can probably understand why these theme parks, these physical theme parks are just really expensive and why they're looking um, at technology, at AR and VR and what can they do to reduce the cost and bring the foot traffic back. And so this is where augmented reality and virtual reality are just fantastic because they offer just so much opportunity 
at a much, much lower cost. Um, we're finishing a little bit early here um, because I've kind of like been racing through it. So I guess, you know, like we're ready to kind of go to questions. Don't know what questions we have, if we have any questions. Sure, thank you, Melanie, for that fantastic presentation. Um, I know that several, that there are several park agencies here in the US that would be interested in this technology. Um, they've asked me before, so now that I know the different options, I'll be able to point them in the right direction. So that's great information. Looks like we have Neil on the line still. If, if you have any questions, um, please type in the chat box or just use the microphone. Otherwise, I just um, remembered one thing to add uh, that might be quite interesting for um, the cities that are looking at digital events and, and they may have come across that problem before. What we found is that especially around New Year, um, the park signs that have been put up have been quite often destroyed or, um, you know, vandalized or whatever. So part of the challenge for us has also been to get people to check whether the park signs were still up mm -hmm. or um, whether they were still accurate, whether they were still up to date, whether they needed to be updated. Um, we make sure that we offer to the various cities um, new park posters. Like we basically provide them with the graphics and they just need to print them and place them. Um, and we learn from some of the cities here that um, there was a breakdown with their park servicing staff. So some of the park servicing staff didn't realize that there was a digital playground. And so um, because the city logo wasn't big enough, they started taking the park signs down because they thought somebody else had put them up. Mm. So that was a little bit uh, counteractive, you know, it didn't really help. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in general, you know, for instance, sometimes um, another time we had uh, somebody painting a fence and they took the signs down, but then forgot to put them back up. So it's, it, it does obviously also help for people to, on an ongoing basis, to go around and check that the park signs are still up because it really drives the traffic, makes a huge difference. Right. Also things like flyers to schools and letting the nearby schools know um, what's in the park. Mm -hmm. What I've seen here in the U.S. is the use of the QR code uh -huh. signs. And you mentioned that those don't work quite as well in New Zealand, and I'm wondering why that is. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, no, they have just not been adopted as much. And I think part of it is that uh, the app has to have a QR code scanner in it. If you need a separate QR code scanner to go to the website, that's your first hurdle. A lot of people won't have a QR code scanner on their phone or won't even realize that they do have one mm -hmm. by default. Um, so it's just not being very adopted and those people that relied on QR code scanning to drive traffic to their website just paid the price for it. Um, so that's a bit of a pity. But um, at the same time, yeah, the, the biggest thing that I find works is really word of mouth. And that is where social media comes in. So we've seen Facebook posts go absolutely crazy. Um, councils will put the videos up on Facebook for their community. People would tag other families. People would start um, creating family picnics around it and say, hey, you know, like let's get our families together next weekend and we go to the park, we have a picnic and we play. Um, it's been really, really fantastic to see that. So, yeah, it's, it's the word of mouth is really the most important around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So you also mentioned um, equity briefly. So maybe kids that don't have access to these devices. I'm wondering if you know if there are any park agencies that have purchased um, devices for kids to use or organized programs around digital playgrounds. That's really interesting because yes, there are, um, especially in the lower decile areas, there are libraries that um, have been trying to help youth that um, are a little bit um, 
yeah, say on the poorer side. And so the kids can go into the library and either rent a basketball, but they can also go into the library and rent a device. And um, you might kind of like think that uh, they wouldn't look after the device well enough or they wouldn't bring them back, but they have. So we've got really good track records with that. Um, we also have a lot of coding clubs for kids where kids go after school and, um, and basically learn to code and they also have access to play these games and to learn and to come up with their own game world. So schools love using what we're doing. They've seen benefit in it um, for kids to, for instance, um, learn reading, like I mentioned earlier on, but also to learn a little bit about technology. Uh, teachers in IT would use them to explain the sensors that are being used and how it works because at the beginning of the game we have to teach the kids how to calibrate the device so that the compass will work and, and show the exact um, direction or the correct correction. Um, so we're working very closely with schools. Uh, another project that um, we're working on at the moment with uh, schools here is to teach them emergency management through augmented reality. So that's something that um, will be rolled out in a few months. And then I can talk a little bit more about it and show some videos. Um, but it's augmented reality is a fantastic tool to get communities engaged, to teach the kids. And so the schools are adopting the devices. The schools are helping the kids that do not have access to those devices to use them at the school. Mm -hmm. So we find that, um, 10% of the kids in schools are not leaving their classroom. If we, for instance, give them mobile games that lure them outside into the yard to play, that gets another few percent of those 10% outside. So that's another reason why the schools like it, um, because they may not have the chance to do it at home, so they do it at the school. Mm -hmm. They've used it for anti-bullying, which is quite interesting. So they would team up an older student with a younger student and the older student would teach the younger student how to play the game. Um, and we're now starting to use it for teaching language as well. So there's, there's a lot of different areas where um, for those kids that do not have access to those devices, they get the benefit at school because we're moving into what's called serious gaming, educational gaming. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, and, and on that note, so for instance, um, our game Magical Park has got at the moment five games that are always active apart from seasonal games. And so one of those games, for instance, is a recycling game where the kids learn about picking up rubbish. And right. that's another, yeah, and that's another reason why the schools are adopting it and why, um, why they're keen on, on, on showing it to the kids and the kids then play it at the school and then they come home and then they tell the parents about it. And then on the weekend they go to the park and play it there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's all word of mouth and within the community um, we've even found that some parents said, look, you know, meet us at the park and your kid can play on our phone. So we've had that as well. So it's been, it's been a real community get together sort of thing. That's great. Do you know any other countries that are that are using this other than New Zealand and China? And are there uh, any countries that yeah, you see not, that might in the future? Yeah, China is not using it yet. We're, we're talking to them about designing indoor augmented reality theme parks. Um, so it's mainly Australia and New Zealand. And Australia, because it's got a much bigger population, obviously, they have a bigger share as well. And um, for them, it's very interesting to run it alongside events. So they might, for instance, have a children's day or they might have um, uh, dinosaurs in the park, movie in the park sort of thing. And they run the event, they run the digital playground alongside. So the park authorities might ring us up, the event manager from the park authority might ring us up and say, I need the playground just for the weekend or I need it for a week, or I need it during the school holidays. It's very popular as an activity during the school holidays. And um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be active the entire time. It might only be active for uh, a certain, certain period of time and be turned on and off. And that's, again, really important that um, it's correctly communicated to um, the families, when is it on, when is it off, where is it, where do I go, what do I need to do to download it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So yeah, I, I can't stress enough um, how important marketing is. And so that's why we're trying to help anyone who's working with us as much as possible on that, on that part. Great. So we have a, another question from Neil, who apologizes for coming in late. Um, he wants to know more about um, accreditation AR for AR playgrounds. Um, says for the push for accreditation of parks, such as the green flag accreditation, whether there is a push to have AR playgrounds accredited. I'm not aware of anything, but there might be. I mean, um, if I understand correctly, because I'm, I'm not too familiar with that, um, it's basically whether they can, um, whether they can be kind of like signed off as whether they're safe. Is that, is that what it means? Um, Neil, can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, either way, I'm not aware of anything at this point in time. Um, I know that there is a huge discussion um, around digital playgrounds ever since Pokemon Go started and mm -hmm. um, because of all the press and all the things that happened. And uh, we wanted to be different from the start. As I said, we came out before Pokemon Go and because um, I'm a step parent and I was obviously very concerned right away about the safety of my own daughter, my own stepdaughter. Um, it, it, it didn't take me very long to realize I can't just put it in the city. I can't just put it in the street because what if she plays where she shouldn't be playing? So that's the reason why health and safety for us was from the start extremely big. Um, we even have a council mentor for in, in Melbourne and he advised us to whatever we do with the game to always think about what's the worst press headline that you can think of and always make sure that you try and avoid that. You know, try and make sure that you put as much safety into the game as you can to avoid the worst case scenario that you can think of. Right. Yeah, safety is huge. I imagine with more of this technology coming out, that accreditation will become. Yeah. Uh, O'Neill says, Green Flag rates playgrounds and allows councils to advertise the playgrounds as accredited once they have the rating. It just raises the standard of accredited playground. That sounds really good. It's, that sounds like something that is really badly needed. Mm -hmm. I haven't been approached about this, um, but we'll definitely connect with them and, and see, you know, like how we can work together. Cause for me, uh, that's just number one. Um, you don't want to put something out there that would put kids at harm. Um, the technology is moving really, really fast and it is getting safer and safer. Um, but I could go on and on about things that we've been um, asked and, and where I've been had to comment on. So one, for instance, is um, a very common question. Why aren't we using headsets? That is super common, that question. And headsets are extremely unsafe. If we were to introduce headsets and you stand face to face with a T-Rex dinosaur, you're not able to see what's beyond them. You're not able to kind of like see what's, what's behind them until you move around them and so that step that you take forward could absolutely devastate you you know like could could get you into harm so into trouble and with the mobile phones or with the mobile tablets you still have peripheral vision you can still see what's around you and that um is one of the the safe keepers <laughs> unless you started to have lifeguards like at pools <laughs> so in closed spaces where they're supervised well, they, they, are working on, um, they are working on methods. So for instance, that um, anything that is closer than two meters to you is getting clipped. So it's kind of like fading out of your view. So if you get too close to something, it just disappears. So that is one way of keeping you safe, but it still limits your peripheral vision. Sorry, I just realized that the lawnmower man is now shown up because the sun's come out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Neil also says yeah. um, one of the main pull factors for playgrounds is the visual. So in other words, when people go past, they come in. 
And besides the social media factor, how do you pull in the community? Yeah, so that is the section where I uh, talked about marketing. So something that's invisible, how do you market that? And the biggest impact is really having good videos that explain exactly what it is, what do people or families, what can they expect when they get to the park? How does it work? What do I need to do to play? Um, and for councils, we tend to send them a whole booklet around um, safekeeping and marketing tips and um, ideas where to place the posters and um, the flyers. We pretty much provide them with as, much temp as many templates as possible so uh, to make it easy. Great. Also says, as a side note, here in Australia, we have Touched by Olivia, which are all ability playgrounds. Some that I've been involved in building, we have included some AR factors. Very sexy. <laughs> yeah, and Touched by Olivia, they were in touch with us early on, um, but we haven't actually managed to work together. And I find that a little bit sad. I would love to kind of um, learn more about what they do and see if we can do something together. I love how you say all ability playgrounds because another app that we've just finished is for kids that are severely um, affected by cerebral palsy. And um, so that was an educational maths game. It's also augmented reality. It's not an outdoor game. It's a learning tool for the classroom. Um, but so one of the sidelines of what we do is not just serious um, gaming and educational gaming, but also um, gaming for disabled. So it would be really interesting to talk some more about that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Melanie, for all this great information. I will definitely be sharing it with the park agencies that we work with who ask us about how they might integrate technology into their parks. So it's great to have this presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for having me. And um, this is a really interesting topic. I know that a lot of councils are trying to learn more about how they can integrate um, digital. Um, urban gaming is on the rise, which is pretty cool but most of the solutions that are out there are for adults and not necessarily for kids. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I think it is quite important to stress test um, all the various options that are out there on, uh, on safety. And we are constantly working on improving what we are doing. That's great. I think something that would be helpful is to have information on the, or the research that you're doing. Um, and how, okay. as far as like getting ki more kids outside and seeing those numbers, is there a place where we can go to find information that uh, you found? Is it on your website or is that something that you might share? I don't, I don't think so as such. I mean, the, the key thing for us is we have tested with over 500 children. So we basically, what we do is we invite children to a park um, with their parents. Uh, the kids get given a game that they've never played before. We watch them, we film them, and then we interview every single child and the parents. And we look for feedback that obviously also gives us an idea in terms of the content, but also to see where did we go wrong, how were the messages interpreted. We look at scenarios where does any of, do any of the children leave the boundary? Do any of the children do something that could get them into harm's way? And so we take all of that into account and then basically try and um, change the messaging or change the way uh, they play. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's constant research. It's constant research mm -hmm. around um, user experience, user interface, and looking at what can we do with the technology that's constantly updating as well to make it better. Great. So, but is this research, is it published anywhere? No, no it's not. No, that's, that's pretty much, I guess that's um, company's IP, probably you could say, you know, that's our expertise that we've um, built over the last three years or more. Okay. Well, thank you. We don't have any more questions. I think we'll wrap up. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And um, hopefully that was interesting to people. And, uh, and if you have any further questions, you can either get hold of me um, via geoairgames.com or my email address, which I actually haven't got on the slide, is melanie at geoairgames.com. Great. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm.